Hi, everybody, and welcome to You Got Mel. Today's edition is dedicated to my friend Miri Berger, who I had a coffee with this morning and who taught me that I should take some of the own medicine that I'm sharing with everybody else. So thank you, Miri, for that. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, we've been talking about acquiring exceptional skills as one of the strategies for being successful. Remember, we're talking about three pillars. One of them is creating your fate, another is recruiting your demons, and the third and the biggest is acquiring as many skills as you can, especially the exceptional, the unanticipated, uh, and uh, the unanticipated. And today we're going to talk about a skill which I call making the right mistakes. Making the right mistakes? An oxymoron, you are going to say, which of course is also an oxymoron. Um, making the right mistakes. Does that make any sense? Are, aren't all mistakes wrong? Well, there's a lot of books that teach you that making mistakes is a bad thing. And today I want to share with you the other side, which is that making mistakes can be a good thing. Let's start at the beginning. The beginning is us. We are mistakes. You know, we are, each of us, one sperm cell out of hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, that succeeds in fertilizing the odd egg embryo, egg creating an embryo. And, you know, we're all mistakes. The second thing is that nature is based on mistakes. I mean, the whole idea of natural selection is that once in a blue moon you get a mutation, most mutations, mutations are mistakes in the DNA, and that mutation usually is harmful. But once in a blue moon, once in several million or billion, that mutation is actually beneficial. We're seeing this now with the COVID virus. And these mutations cause new individuals in species to develop at a faster rate and to outnumber, outgrow the previous. And then the previous mutation becomes part of the regular DNA. So these mistakes are what led us from being bacteria to being human beings. So why this insistence of mine on making the right mistakes because I believe that this is one of the secrets to having a successful life. You know, when we're three or four years old, we like making mistakes. You know, we, um, we learn to ride a bicycle. We make a mistake, we fall off, we get back up. We mispronounce words and laugh at it. We get ideas backwards. Everybody laughs and so do we. But then something happens in our lives, and it's called kindergarten and grade one. And then asking questions and making mistakes and having fun is superseded by something else, which is called answering questions. So I often ask my students, what is the one most important thing that you learn in school? And there's only one answer to that question. And the answer to that question is that there's only one answer for every question. The school answer, the teacher's answer. So if you can add 2 plus 2 equals 4, then you can advance from first grade to second grade. If you think that 2 plus 2 is equal to 11, you might have trouble. In the second or third grade, you learn to divide fractions. You learn that if you take three and you divide it by two-thirds, you flip the second a, a fraction and you get nine divided by two, and that's the correct answer. doesn't even matter if you know why, but getting the right answer gets you through school, and then it gets you to university. And when you graduate from university, you learn that the people who are making the right mistakes are the ones who are getting ahead of you. So we talked about 2 plus 2 equals 4 versus 2 plus 2 equals 11. Well, of course, 2 plus 2 can equal 4, but could it equal 11? 
Well, 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 in base 10 and many other bases. But 2 plus 2 in base 2 is going to equal 100. And 2 plus 2 in base 3 is going to equal 11. So a kid in grade 2 that tells his teacher that 2 plus 2 can also equal 11 and gets punished is actually making the right mistake. Well, maybe he's making the wrong mistake at the time, but he's making a right mistake in a sense. So who decides what are right mistakes and wrong mistakes? Well, a mistake is something that society or specialists decide is a mistake. You know, we thought that Newton wasn't mistaken until Einstein came along and, and said that sometimes he is. Hmm. So, making a mistake is something that society decides now. Making the right mistake is a mistake that turns out to be right several months from now, several years from now, tomorrow, and proving everyone else wrong. Oh, I could cite so many examples. Uh, the Wright brothers, they made the right mistake, didn't they? Uh, how about um, Sir Alexander Fleming, who came back from his vacation, and he saw that his agar dish had a contamination of a fungus, a mistake. But on closer look, he noticed that around the penicillium, there was an inhibition of the bacteria he had been trying to grow. That turned out to be penicillin. That's a right mistake. Several years ago, I traveled with my wife, Shuli, to London to make a short movie with Emma Crouch on how inventions really happen. Uh, I'm going to share the screen for a moment. I'm also going to give you the link to this movie, which I would be happy if you saw. Um, and, uh, whoops, I will send it to you later. Um, and in this movie... I interviewed the head um, pharmacist in a pharmacy in Kensington about mistakes. Because my mouthwash started out as a mistake. And he said to me, Mel, I'll tell you the truth. Have a look at all the drugs we sell. All of these drugs are sold because of their side effects. You know, you think that you're developing a drug for reducing blood pressure. You end up selling it for a different reason altogether. It's called Viagra. So the stuff we buy in pharmacies are mistakes. Most inventions are created by mistake, by observing something that's gone wrong. These sticky pages that we use, the story is, that it started out as the glue that didn't work too well. It was supposed to be a good glue. It wasn't a good glue, but it turns out to be a good glue for sticking things on other things and then taking them off. So let's think about several other kinds of right mistakes. Okay? As a scientist, what do we do? We have a hypothesis, a working hypothesis. We ask a question. And then we try and answer it by doing a controlled experiment. If you're a scientist and you have a hypothesis that isn't testable, like, is there a God, you'll have trouble being accepted by other scientists. You know, the scientific method is having a hypothesis that can be tested using apparatuses, equipment, observations, and so on. So, in my own career, I will tell you a story. Um, I was working in the laboratories of Professor Eugene Rosenberg and Professor David Gutnick on how bacteria that grow on oil and eat oil in oil spills are able to stick to the oil droplets. Oil droplets are very hydrophobic. They are not wettable. They repel water. So I thought I could observe how bacteria stick using a plastic surface, polystyrene, which behaves a lot like the oil surface in repelling water. 
and I observed something strange. One of the bacteria I was testing, Serratia, which is not known as a bacterium that grows on oil, stuck better to the plastic than bacteria that do grow on oil. So I'm a young PhD student, run, 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 run to Eugene. I say, Eugene, something is very peculiar. These non-oil eating bacteria stick better to the hydrophobic surface than the oil eating bacteria. Eugene has an idea. Proved out to be wrong, but an idea is always great. He said, maybe serratia grows on oil and nobody knows. Oh, I say, Eugene, you know, people have known about serratia for thousands of years. He said, test it. So I'm a student. The professor tells me to do an experiment. I do an experiment. So I take serratia, these bacteria, and I inoculate them into a flask that has water, some nutrients, and oil, lots of oil. And I set it to shake all night. And I'm going to come back in the morning and see whether the suspension of bacteria has grown more turbid, more cloudy, which is an indication that the bacteria have grown. I come back in the morning, and the bacteria have not grown at all. Now, you might be thinking, time to wash the flask and throw everything out. But on second observation, I noticed that the initial turbidity of the bacteria that I had inoculated the previous evening had disappeared. The bacteria had gone. They had left the house. Now, bacteria, like a lot of things, don't disappear. I started looking for where they might have been. They weren't stuck to the glass. They were stuck to the oil droplets. Oh, that was already very interesting. You can take bacteria, a cloudy solution of bacteria, mix them together with oil droplets and see whether they stick or not as a very simple test to see whether bacteria have this hydrophobic property of sticking to hydrophobic surfaces. You're not going to believe this, but this turned into a method that I published with my professors in 1980. And to this day, my first paper became also my most cited paper. And 41 years later, people are still using that simple method to look at the outer surfaces of bacteria. And even more profitable for me, this basic idea of using oil to capture bacteria turned into this oil water mouthwash that I will be telling you about. And this is, of course, one of the mistakes that changed my life. Of course, um, you can benefit from the mistakes made by somebody else. Let's look at the stock market. I'm not an expert on stocks. My brother David is. Uh, but one thing I learned is that if you have a stock and you're selling it for $20 because you think that $20 is a good price to get for it, somebody else in the world, maybe in Singapore, is buying the stock that you're selling for $20 because he thinks that it's a steal for $20 to buy this stock. One of you is right and one is wrong. The stock is going to go up or it's going to go down. So if it goes down, his mistake turned into my right mistake. Two more things I would like to share with you. One of them is that you can make mistakes on purpose. I'll give you another example. Jeff Pulver invited me to give a talk about the things I learned in kindergarten and school. And I was going on, as I tend to do, talking about being a fish in the school system and not fitting in. And at that certain moment, standing in front of the hundreds of people, I blurted out, I was a Miss Fish. Now, it wasn't planned, but I had the idea a second or two before I blurted it out. So I created a word, a Miss Fish just like the word oxymoron, or brunch, breakfast and lunch. So these mistakes turn into words. And if I go back to one of my heroes, 
right, to, uh, to Jabberwocky, some of the words that Lewis Carroll invented by combining different words, what we call a portmanteau, turned into legitimate words in a dictionary which I can now use in my Scrabble game, which was also kind of invented by Lewis Carroll. Finally, there's a lot of people that notice the mistakes of others and turn them into inventions. For example, restriction enzymes. The people who discovered the restriction enzymes didn't figure out what they were good for. Uh, I invented once something, and somebody came along a year later and found a better way to do the same thing, or at least a cheaper way. So, in summary, mistakes are something good. We exist because of mistakes. And we should teach our children that it's okay to make mistakes. You can't learn chess without making mistakes. You can't play a soccer game without making mistakes. The only way not to make mistakes in life is not to do anything. And getting the right answers is not as important as asking good questions. And very often, the answer that everybody else gets is not the answer that's going to lead you to an invention or a breakthrough. So it's very hard, I know, to go back in time to the age of four or five and to be foolish and to say, you know what, I have this idea. Everybody's going to say it's a mistake. You know, I have this idea where everybody is going to help me map cities and discover what's the best way to drive from here to there. <laughs> How many venture capitalists did not invest in Waze? Ah, and this is so common, right? And Waze didn't start out that way. They made a mistake in their thinking, and then they pivoted which is what a lot of startups do. You start doing something, you realize that's not the right way to do it, and then you make a, another turn, which turns into the right mistake. So I'm a big believer in making mistakes, provided that you can learn from them, that you can observe them, that you're curious about everything that you hear. If somebody tells you 42, you have to wonder about 42. I wasted a whole half year of my PhD research because I believed something that somebody wrote in a paper. I ended up teaching my students, don't believe anything in a paper. <laughs> Disbelieve everything and then work backwards. I once had a student who came crying into my laboratory. He said, Mel, my experiment worked out wrong. He said, there's no such thing. There's an experiment that you haven't controlled for properly. Do you know why you got a different answer? He said, yes, I know, but it wasn't the answer that you wanted. It wasn't your hypothesis. I said, Shimon, that's going to lead to a much better paper. It's OK to be wrong. In fact, sometimes it's the right way to live your life. Thanks so much, and see you soon.